Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Siddim against Kedoria Omar, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. May God add his blessing to that word. You can be seated. Jeff, why in the world did you choose a passage like this, right? Where are we going this morning? I was reading the other night uh, a passage in Isaiah. It reads like this. Isaiah 49, chapter, or verse 6 says, God says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Do you see what God is saying there? God is saying, I'm too big to just save Israel. So when he sent Jesus, he wasn't just interested in a few people or some people or even most people. Jesus was sent by God so that all people might have the possibility of coming to know his love and his salvation. You know, sometimes on this side of the cross, those of us who have experienced salvation and know Jesus, that sometimes we forget where people are when they don't know Christ. People are in bondage. Bondage to sin, bondage to Satan, bondage to death. But before they can be saved by the gospel, there is a sobering truth. Someone has to share the gospel with them. Now, as we look at this ancient story in the book of Genesis, the setting is fairly bleak. A powerful coalition has been formed consisting of battle-tested and land-hungry kings who have become skillful and fearless. If you were to take a, a look at the land and all the peoples that this group had conquered, you would soon discover that this group had defeated giants. They had overcome other powerful kings. They had waged war and battle against cave, cave dwellers. So they were skilled in all si uh, sorts of warfare. This is not an easy thing for them to do. But through that experience, they had developed strategies for battle. They have now invaded the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what we see here is they have not only taken the food and the riches of the city and the area, but the Bible says they have also taken the man Lot. He's now a prisoner, perhaps not for long, because they may kill him very soon. Now, if you've been reading along, and, and every once in a while, I haven't made note of this really, but you see that Lot is the nephew of Abraham. He is nephew uh, the nephew of Abram, and, and he has made all the journeys thus far with Abram. And as we begin to study Abraham, we have learned that, that in Scripture, he is the premier example in the Old Testament of what it means to have a relationship with God. It was this simple faith in God that allowed him to walk with God and experience all the benefits of what it is to know God. And what we begin to see is, is that as, as Abraham grows in his faith, as he walks with God, he actually begins to take on God's character imperfectly. And we'll see that. But I would argue that this is one of those passages that gives us a glimpse 
of that character even in this story. Well, how does that happen? Lot is a prisoner. Lot is held captive. What do you do when your brother is held captive? Well, let's think about that together this morning. You know, there are three ways that we can think about this and three ways we might look at this situation. One of the things we might do, the, the first thing we might do is nothing at all. After all, my brother, well, he needs to take care of himself. It's his responsibility. We might call that, in fact, the human responsibility factor. Now, you may or may not know the story of Lot, but if you know his story at all, you know that Lot has not always made the best choices either. When Abram and Lot were experiencing difficulty with their herds, they were running into each other, causing commotion, not getting along very well. Abraham says to Lot, we need to get away from each other. We need to get some space here, or otherwise I'm going to kill you. I don't think he said that, but that's kind of what we, we hear in that passage. Families, as you know, can be complicated, and we can love our families, but we may not always like them to be around all the time. And so wisely, Abram says, we need some space. And so Abram, the elder, says, Lot, choose where you would like to go. God has given me all this land someday, but for now, you choose where you want to be, and I'll go the other way. Now, Abram is being you know, gracious here, but as the elder in that culture especially, but even if you think about it in our culture too, he should have had first dibs. God had made the promise to him. But Lot, he goes ahead and he chooses the very best land, the good land, a great place to raise cattle. And he leaves Abraham to, to farm on the rocky hillsides. As the young guy, you would have expected him to say, hey, you know what, I can handle this part. But instead, Lot says, no, I'm going to choose the very best. He should have said to his uncle, you take the best. But instead, he, he chooses it for himself. And he pro proves, us, uh, proves himself to be rather selfish, self-focused, indulgent. He chooses himself over another. But what's interesting to me is that you read this passage is you begin to realize something else about Lot. In, For instance, in Genesis 13, verse 12, the Bible says that Lot pitches his tent toward or near Sodom. I think the Bible was telling us something there too. You, you know the name Sodom and Gomorrah. Boy, when we hear that, even to this day, we see that it's often equated with absolute evil. They were so wicked, they would eventually face an even greater judgment from God. So think about what Lot has done. Not only has he chosen the best place to farm over Abraham, but he's chosen a rather bad place to live. He's enticed by the lights and the lure of sin in the culture around him, and eventually it has a pretty profound effect on his family. In fact, by the time you get to chapter 14, verse 12, it now doesn't say Lot lived near Sodom. What's it say? He lived in Sodom. Something's going on here. And I think there's an important lesson. You know, when it comes to sin, you never just play around the edges. Eventually, you move in. You Keep being interested in Sodom, eventually it will be a part of you and you will be a part of it. You see, familiarity, we say, breeds contempt, but that's not always true. I think at first, Lot didn't approve of what was going on in that city, but it was so interesting. You know, it, it looks like a fun place. Interesting, live and let live. You think about it, familiarity actually breeds complacency. Well, what are you going to do? I think Lot's wife liked to look in the shops and the stores. The, Lot enjoyed the entertainment, maybe the sports. His children were going to get to go to the best schools, never mind that they undermined 
the values that he used to have, they'd be okay. He'd be okay. And we see how sin just creeps in. I came across this quote from Alexander Pope. He wrote, Sin is a vice of frightful mean. As to be hated needs to be seen, yet seen too oft familiar with her face. We first endure, then pity, then embrace. It would be very easy in my mind to believe, well, you know, Lot chose his lot. He chose to live near Sodom. If he didn't go where he was, he wouldn't be where he is. It's his fault. It's his problem. He got himself into the mess, let him get himself out. 2 Timothy 2.26 speaks of those who have fallen into the trap of the devil who, have take, who has taken them captive to do his will. Satan has many people in bondage today. And we see those around us in trouble, it can be a very natural response. Well, he got himself there, let him deal with his own problem. I've got enough of my own. But you know, there's another response. We could say, you know what, I'm not going to do anything. I'll do nothing because this is God's responsibility. We might see this as the sovereignty of God factor. There's the human responsibility factor, but this is the sovereignty of God. You and I believe that God is ultimately in control. God is in the middle of everything that occurs. God knows where Lot is. If God wants to, he can deliver Lot. If Lot goes free, then it was God's will for it to happen. If Lot remains captive, well, that must be God's will too. In Christianity, there is a fact, uh, there is in fact a theological camp that teaches that God has predestined some to be saved and predestined some to be lost. In other words, there's nothing you can do. If you're destined to be lost, and for that matter, if you're destined to be chosen, you can't get out of either. I would argue, however, that the Bible tells us that God's heart is clearly for all people. He doesn't want anyone to perish and be lost. 1 Timothy 2.4 tells us, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God doesn't want to turn his back on anyone. But some say, well, let God deal with it. And if you think about it, both of those responses are logical and make sense and certainly make it easier. What do I do when my brother is held captive? What do I do when he's in trouble? Nothing. It's his fault. It's his responsibility. Or we might say, I'm not doing anything. This is up to God. But I want you to know, I think there is a third option. And this is the option that Abram chooses. As Abram walks with God, he begins to understand an important principle. God delivers people through his people. What do I do when my brother is held captive? Verse 14 tells us, he pursued him. And I believe that that is the scriptural response that we are to have to our neighbors, to our family, to our world. Because I think the Bible is clear. You remember the story in Genesis when Cain murders his own brother Abel and he says to God, am I my brother's keeper? It turns out, yes. Yes, you are. And so what I want to consider this morning is that God calls each of us as Christians to be involved with and take that third option to be a part of the solution. 
But we also need to realize if we decide to do that, to go after our brothers and our sisters, to be concerned about those who are lost and held captive, to be concerned about missions and what's going on in Illyria with the launch this morning or, 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 or concerned about evangelism, breaking bondage that people are in, I want you to know there are some things that we need to be aware of. Because if you decide to go, if you decide to pursue there's a price to be paid. One of the things I noted here is, did you notice how many men Abraham took with him? He had some trained men, the Bible says. And you think, well, that's great. He's got some trained men. And I think, but what are they trained for? Abraham was a sheep herder. And I suspect that's what they were trained for as well. And the Bible says he took about 318 sheep herders with him. 318 men against five kings with skilled and veteran armies? Are you kidding me? Is Abraham crazy? There's no way he's going to be able to battle with these guys. And then I think when we talk about winning the world for Jesus Christ, or I just want to share with my neighbor or my coworker, I kind of wonder, am I crazy? You know what's going on in this world today? And you know how people think? And you know how awkward that can be? I'm not trained for this. So, so many people, so many languages, so many worldviews, so many other ways of thinking out there. Do you know the stranglehold that sin has on his life? The only time that guy ever uses the name Jesus Christ is as a curse word. I want to tell you something this morning. Pursuing people means we're going to go against the odds. It will look like an impossible task. But may I remind you that at one point you were an impossible task? And aren't you glad that someone didn't give up on you? You're here this morning because someone else paid a price. They cared enough, they gave, they, they shared. They, they probably didn't have a doctorate in theology. They didn't say exactly the right thing, but they loved Christ. And whether even or not they knew your name, they loved you. And that was enough. And so, folks, if we're going to pursue our brother, don't be surprised if you don't totally feel prepared for the task. There's something else that I learned here as I think about this passage. Abraham, when he made the decision to pursue his brother, he doesn't hold anything back. He committed everything in his house to pursuing Lot. Every man was put to the task. Listen, sometimes I find myself getting rather shy about asking for resources from you all. And a lot of times when we think about resources, of course, we think about money. But it's so much more than that. And I got to tell you, when I hear that, you know, someone's gotten a promotion or your business is doing well, there's, there's an, a genuine excitement in me for you. But there is also a part of me that starts to think, God, I know you're blessing this person so that they can help fulfill the vision that God has for this church, their church. Because there are plenty of unsaved people in North Olmstead. A lot of brothers who are held captive. And sometimes it happens, not always, but, but sometimes people will say, you know, God has blessed me, and I'm going to take what I have and use it. I told you I get shy, but sometimes then I really start to think biblically, biblically about what's at stake. If we're going to be a great church, we need to talk about missions. We need to care about the lost. We need to be in prayer. Lord, show us the way. Teach us how to share. We need to think strategically about how to engage our community so that they see us in action, that they know that it's real and it's not just a bunch of fluff or religiosity or a bunch of rules. And yes, sometimes that takes our best resources. When Abraham decided to pursue his brother, he didn't hold anything back. It was all on the line. What price are you willing to pay? to free your brothers and sisters. 
I'll never forget one time I had a conversation with a man who just happened to come in off of the street. His name was Anton. He had just uh, wanted to call his wife and use the phone, but uh, we happened to strike up a conversation, and in a deep accent, I learned that he was from Ukraine. And he told me how he had found Christ and through the faithful witness of his sister. His sister had shared the gospel with him. He came to Jesus, and he said, you know, once I found Jesus, I, I just had to share him with as many people as I could. And he told me the story how over the course of just a few years, he lost eight jobs in a row because of his faith. Now, he was living in the Ukraine, and Ukraine was completely communist at that point. It was still the rule of the day. His bosses were all atheists, and Christianity was basically illegal. And they said to him, you can believe in God, but you just need to stop talking about Jesus. But he couldn't help it. He had to share. And so he would get fired, and he'd have to search for another job. He talked a little bit about how the authorities would follow him and how he had kind of a black mark on him. At, at that point, as he spoke to me, uh, uh, he had just been in the U.S. for five years, and he proudly told me he had just passed his citizenship test. And you know what I was interested to find that he was doing here? <laughs> he was sharing Jesus. He was working with the Slavic people groups in the Cleveland area sharing the gospel message and I remember just thinking about this man and there's a man who knows what it is to pay a price to pursue his brother he told me you know I, there were a lot of times when I thought I would go hungry but I never did and then I think you know Jeff what price have I paid you know it's easy for me to grumble and feel bleh, when there are needs out there to give with you know this morning I'm thinking of the Cleveland Pregnancy Center as we think about Roe v. Wade and the overturn and the work that we still need to do as a community I think about Elyria and the resources we put in there I think oh where are we going to get those resources that we need when we we have this 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 tremendous uh, work we're doing in Malawi with the students and we're committed to 15 students and Lord I'm short on some of those funds right now but you know what happens when you walk with God that's where he takes you if you want to know if you're walking with God do you care that your brothers held captive thirdly I would note this pursuing your brother is going to take some time Abraham pursued Lot and his captors clear to the north near Damascus in fact and the best I can estimate as I was thinking about this is it was at least around 240 miles north of where Abraham was 240 miles is a long trek in that day it's a long enough trek today and sometimes you have to go a long way to reach other people to be honest with you there are not a lot of people I would pursue for 240 miles after graduating college I stayed in Wilmore Kentucky to attend seminary however Mary who also graduated at Asbury uh, moved back to Pennsylvania she got a job it was a 12 or 13 hour trip back and forth I knew Mary loved me because after she got her job with every extra day off she'd come and visit me for a weekend 12, 13 hours, didn't matter. We might be together less than the driving time, but that's what she'd do. And I did the same thing when I could because that's what you do when you love each other. But for Abraham, it would have meant trips, uh, a trip of weeks, leaving his herds, his fortune, his family, his wife. It was not going to be a quick fix. Now, I'm like you. I'm always fascinated by those people who hear the gospel once and immediately they come to Jesus and they say yes. Those are great stories, but usually it's not the way it works. I'm glad that that happens sometimes. But if you are really serious about seeing a brother or sister come to Jesus, you've got to be patient. 
be prepared for a long journey because the task of sharing the gospel through your life often takes time, hours in prayer, hours of, of opportunity where people are just allowed to watch you and see, is it real? Watching you to see the evidence that your faith makes a difference. Pursuing people is hard work. It takes everything you have. It will take time. But there's one other thing. I, I realize that Abraham was really smart when it came to this. He didn't just take off without a plan. He reacted intelligently. He was clever. You'll see that he divides his troops so that they would be able to attack on two sides, which caused the enemy so much confusion and fear that they actually won the battle. And man, do we need to be wise in our approach to those outside of the church. I heard about a doctor who had a flat tire outside of an insane asylum, and he started changing the tire. As he was about finished, however, he kicked over the hubcap that had the lug nuts in it, and the lug nuts then rolled down the grate into the sewer. They were gone. Well, inside the fence of the asylum was a man who watched the whole thing, and the doctor is frustrated. What am I going to do? How, is this, how am I getting out of here? And the man on the other side of the fence finally said, Sir, why don't you just take one lug knot off the other three wheels and put it on the spare wheel, and it'll be solid enough for you to get to the service station. The doctor said, wow, That's a pretty great idea. Thank you a lot. He said, But let me ask you something. With an answer like that, what are you doing in here? And the man said, I may be crazy, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> you know, we, we are like stupid Christians sometimes when it comes to sharing our faith. Our responses need to be thought out and, 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 and with integrity and purpose. Matthew 10, Jesus said, I'm going to send you into the world and you be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. We're not always gentle. We're not always shrewd. I don't think we need those door-to-door -door surveys. I'm taking a survey today of people who are going to hell. Can you tell me why you're going? I'm not sure that that works. We've got to be gracious and tactful. Colossians 4, 5 says, Be wise in the ways you act toward outsiders make the most of every opportunity let your conversation always be seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone i think we can be a witness without being obnoxious a small group was uh, introducing themselves at their first meeting and one man said you know i'm a corporate lawyer another lady said i'm a plastic surgeon another person said i'm a design engineer the one young woman introduced herself and she said, I'm an evangelist for Jesus Christ, cleverly disguised as a checkout lady at Walmart. <laughs> one more point, and I don't want you to miss this. This is really the point. You will notice that Abram didn't didn't go to those 318 men and say, okay, guys, I want you to go out there and go get my brother, face those five kings and their armies, and bring back my nephew, Lot. Good luck now. Get out there. Get back as soon as you can. I've got a lot of work to do here, and sent them on their way. That's not what Abraham did. The scripture says that Abraham led them out. He did the pursuing. And that just reminds me, don't just let someone else do this. It is a responsibility and hope in the kingdom of God that every person will be engaged in pursuing their brother. And if we desire to see someone come to Christ, if he's put someone on our hearts, no one is going to help them into the kingdom 